Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Chris Shang. Today, we have Ravi Jain, who is the founder and host of The Ravi Show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Chris, uh, for inviting me uh, to the Thought Leaders uh, Leader Pro uh, the, you know, podcast. I'm kind of excited to chat with you today. Of course. Tell us a little bit about The Ravi Show, how long you've been doing it, um, what kind of content are you guys creating? Awesome. Uh, so it's been almost close to five and a half years back uh, when we started the Ravid Show. It's more like media and marketing company, but we also, uh, you know, go out and amplify the voices in the data and AI space. We've been creating a lot of content around uh, with leaders in this space and uh, helping obviously companies in the data and AI world to uh, talk about uh, their product in the most uh, authentic way, in the most, most non-salesy way and what type of problem they're solving, but also uh interviewing those enterprise leaders on the Robert show who are actually uh working in the data and ai space and talking about various problems solutions data ai and uh, creating co content for at least uh 750,000 big data ai community that follows us not only just on youtube linkedin twitter uh newsletter uh but various other platforms podcast platforms as well the idea when we started obviously was to make sure where uh, we are helping and bringing the community together to learn a, in the most easy and authentic conversation because I feel conversations kind of bring a lot of uh, interesting aspects that are kind of missing. We keep it as casual as possible. If you might have uh, got a chance to obviously tune, tune in, uh, you'll see the most interesting conversations in the easiest way where a non-technical person listening to the conversation would also feel very much... Uh, that they can learn from it, but at least those who are in the technical space, they'll relate to it and they can, you know, obviously upskill themselves. Um, it's a team of, the Ravid Show is now a, a team of more than 10 people that we have. A uh, media team doesn't need uh, hundreds of people, at least for now. Uh, but yeah, we kind of uh, do a lot of content creation in this space and kind of make sure where the community can benefit out of uh, the conferences that we visit, the in companies that we bring on board, to help them amplify their messaging, but also the enterprise leaders can come and talk and uh, share their experience, which could be a learning experience for other enterprises out there. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I love that idea of like tr basically digesting very complicated, you know, theories and, and products or tools and then making it more digestible for the general population. I feel like there's a lot of, especially, I think it's really relevant now, especially because with, you know, AI and data and all that stuff, um, I don't think, I don't think enough people are educated around it where they can make smart decisions around, uh, around and navigate through that that ecosystem. I still feel like there is a lot that are still not privy to. Uh, I think like their their own personal securities. You know, I think like um, we see this all the time. But this is a good example of like you know what are you opting into when you're accepting all cookies and like how things are being tracked as it relates back to your personal information or habits and behaviors. And, the, you know, obviously like a lot of these security companies make it difficult and challenging to actually opt out. So like, if you want to reject it, you have to go to another screen and you have to choose all these other things. And so people are not exactly. necessarily, you know, very easy to know what is happening with that information when they opt in. Right. So, um, but I love that. I love the idea of that. Um, let's talk about a little bit more about your background, how you got into doing this in the first place. Uh, before we, you know, before we dive into the actual journey and the process of how you formalized the show, because I'm sure it started off as something more of like a side project and then it developed into something a little bit more. But um, but how did you get into content in the first place? What was your you know chapter before in terms of your career? You're right, Chris. Uh, this was actually like a side hustle. But just to go a little back in my career, obviously, I'm a, uh, I have a background in finance and I've done my investment banking where I've, I've you know, obviously done my post valuation, my master's in uh, being a finance guy. I was like, I love numbers. That's not a problem. But uh, numbers also kind of play a very important role when we talk about data. And, uh, you know, I kind of, and it's an irony that obviously being in an, uh, coming from a finance background, I started working in market research company, which is more like uh, where I used to actually uh, create market research reports. And I used to work in, uh, you know, developing in uh, bringing, working on, you know, primary and secondary data where I used to actually pull those kind of data into to create market research reports, uh, not only just around, you know, uh, you 
IT, but also various other industries like chemical, manufacturing, could be healthcare as well, and create reports and collect data and you know forecast the markets for those types of uh, different products that we were working on. And that's when, you know, to be honest, I understood that okay, data is going to play a very important role in the coming years, and it was definitely playing a very important role over the years already. But uh, uh, that was the starting point. But uh, slowly and steadily, when I moved, obviously, to uh, different jobs where that where I was, I kind of started working for a company which is Pack Publishing. If you've heard about O'Reilly, it's like the same uh, competitor to O'Reilly, Pack Publishing and IT Publishing uh, books. And that's where I used to actually commission books. And books is something uh, which is very close to me as well. I love reading books. I'm uh, and that's where you know I used to actually commission books in data and AI and I used to closely work with data science and AI authors and that was like actually the 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 I would say a spark which kind of you know made me curious more about the data science and AI space about how it kind of works uh, what are the gaps and uh, since I used to commission books it used to be so uh, easy for me to you know do a lot of research around data and AI and that's where I used to learn more and more about data and AI, but also put books together where I was commissioning books, where I used to actually create, find a topic which is interesting to the market, where these books would actually sell, who are the communities would be interested. And I found so many gaps, but, you know, at when when thinking about the larger picture, I kind of feel that uh, I kind of started also slowly realizing that there's so much gap and there's so much of learning that needs to happen in this space, in the data and AI space specifically. Uh, how can I fill that gap? And, you know, talking about that, that's how, you know, uh, on on a side gig, I kind of started the rubber show as well, where I was like, okay, can I do live shows? and bring in maybe these authors who are building books and how would it help, but not only just that, also other leaders in the space, the thought leaders who can come and share about different things. But that was the starting point. And this is like a little background about myself, being a finance guy, now obviously spent almost close to 10 years in data and AI. Uh, and uh, obviously I'm still learning and I'm pretty sure it's a space which kind of evolves so quickly, like at least in the AI space we have seen in the last uh, four years, it has evolved. It it still does evolve every month now, but at least three years or four years back when, Ch you know, three years back when Chad GPT kind of came out and um, it was evolving every hour. I used to get news every hour. There has been so much funding that has got into it, but that's, uh, you know, a little background about myself, Chris. Got it. Um, interesting. So I would, I mean, let's dive. So when, I guess like going into the Ravit show, you know, how, at what point did that go from a side hustle to start becoming something more legitimate where you felt like, what were the indicators that you were seeing that um, gave you the confidence to push a little bit more all in? That's a good question. In terms of, you know, obviously indicators, I kind of feel that, uh, once I started with the Robert Show, obviously spending two years into it, I kind of interviewed more than 100 leaders in this space. And that's when I kind of, you know, started realizing that there's so much in, uh, in, in, in that years, in those years, obviously there were so many companies reaching out to me as well. There are obviously bigger players in the space. The tech giants obviously also wanting to, uh, you know, be a part of it. So we kind of felt that, okay, this comes out more as a media, as a press for, you know, the bigger tech giants. We are now being a voice for the industry as well. So how do we capitalize? How can we make sure where, even if we want to make this as a business, we want to still be, uh, very much uh, on, on the principles where it's helpful for the community, that the community doesn't have to pay a single penny to come on the show, to learn, you know, from the best leaders of the world who are coming on the show and keep it more like uh, a content creation, uh, uh, you know, for the community and for us as well. And, uh, you know, obviously creator economy is like another big thing which kind of played a very important role on the side by side where uh, now you kind of, you know, obviously people call us influencers, creators, uh, some tell us media, press, but then 
uh, for us it kind of played a very important role as well call us anything but uh, if you want to create content that would be helpful for the community and if we can bring that free for the community nothing like that and uh, you know those uh, companies reaching out to us um, and saying that okay we want to have our leaders on the show we want to have our customers sharing about the experiences about different products that they are using as well in again in the no, most non salesy way possible i was like okay fine this could be a starting point and slowly and steadily we got into you know obviously talking to a lot more companies in this space in the data and ai space and then it's like a snowball effect when you kind of you know obviously work with 10 companies there are 10 different other companies who would be like okay we want to be featured here as well we want to see how you can amplify but for the community it's more on the lines where they get to learn on a daily basis about various things uh, that are happening in the space and you kind of also start feeling more responsible about things uh, i was still you know obviously working for companies in a advisory manner but then one day obviously you have to make that decision where you kind of have a lot of work that you have to do and you have to you know get to the other side to make sure now it's 100% you go all in for the community and the rubber show happened there where uh, we made sure that uh, we have various other platform various other things that we are doing uh, just to help the community and make sure that they get to learn about data and ai in the most simplest way we still follow that principle we still make sure that everything's free for the community uh, and uh, you know those kind of were the initial indicators for us to get into the space full time and you know obviously uh make a business out of it make a media company but at the same time still be out there for the 750000 big data ai community that we have currently and we're growing slowly and steadily got it um i want to kind of talk about the data and in the in the ai component uh you've had yep. a lot of guests you know i think like similarly through this 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 podcast the what we what i've been doing what we've been doing through thought leaders you know you get exposure to a lot of expert individuals that have a right. wealth of knowledge on the topics um what have been and i think like things just start popping up so what are some of the themes trends that you've been you've been doing this for 5 years but how what is that what's evolved like what are some of the things if you're to like kind of like take nuggets from different periods um what were like what were you noticing in the very beginning like when you started off and and maybe with like just the hyper growth of just ai in general like you mentioned the past couple two three years um but like maybe starting there and what was like the primary talk topics and then what has it been like more today so uh, that's a good question uh, chris i feel you know there's various things that kind of when we started obviously uh ai was still there uh, back then as well but it was in that strong we had obviously conversations more around the modern data stack it was just building up that time and we were talking more about the various categories that were built uh and the conversations used to be around you know those modern data stack and how does it play a important role the company is going from the legacy system to the new modern data stack how does it all evolve and all of those things you know in various different categories that we spoke with uh, the players in various categories there was a, there were a lot of companies that were getting into the space at that time and uh, obviously we wanted to be the first ones to you know talk to their leaders talk to their customers and now uh, almost after you know and then you know obviously uh, it stayed to data ai uh, it stayed to data and then obviously once open ai kind of came up with chat gpt that's where the blast actually happened around ai and since then uh, what we have realized is uh, there's a lot of talking that the data companies are doing around ai as well everyone wants to have ai as a component in their data uh, data product as well uh, some are still working on it it's still not i wouldn't say like obviously we haven't reached ai as of now but then uh, there are companies who have really implemented ai in the most uh, uh you know authentic way possible and the customers are actually making the most out of it uh and this is the current conversations that we have around is around the implementation first it used to be around data first first one in one and a half year two years around when ai kind of came into the game as well uh it used to be around 
uh, everyone was kind of figuring out how does it all work, RAG, vector database. We kind of spoke about all those things. We still talk about it. Um, but then uh, obviously once there's a lot of investment that comes into AI, uh, the, there's a little maturity that kind of comes into the game. And that's what happened in the last uh, one, one and a half year that we've seen so much of maturity that has happened in the AI space that has been billions that has been billion of dollars that has been invested in AI now and companies are really doing something massive there are even companies in data who have kind of uh, pivoted from data to now having an AI product into the game because that's the talk of the town every enterprise leaders want to know how can they have AI into their data stack as well so uh you know now it's all about ai we know everyone's uh you know there are bigger enterprise companies who are betting a lot of money in ai uh there's obviously a lot of talking that happens in data uh we did a massive uh just a few months back we did a massive meetup around gen ai uh and the irony is Every person, there were like around eight speakers. Every person that came and sp spoke about uh, generative AI had uh, slides and every slide had like data quality, which was mentioned in there. So that kind of also took me back with, okay, so in the end, it's also about the data quality that you need to care about when you're talking about AI. So there's obviously data still plays a very important role. It will still play a very important role. It's just that with the AI capabilities that we are currently talking to a lot of players, a lot of leaders in the space, it will just boost and skill, you know, uh, it, it will just be an added skill to, you know, the, the, the engineers out there and they'll, uh, the productivity will increase, the cost will go down, the scalability will be faster. And this is what, is the current conversation in this space when we are talking about AI, how literate you are with AI is something, another big thing that has been, you know, obviously everyone's still learning. As I said in the beginning, it's not where we have reached a level where everyone knows everything. Uh, obviously, there are people who know about certain categories in AI as well. I haven't seen much of categories as of now in AI, but I'm kind of thinking that there'll be... Uh, categories would be, which would be made in the AI uh, space as well very soon. Interesting. Um, very similar to some of those conversations. How, where do you think like the, the topic of security comes in? Has that been something that's relevant? Obviously, I think like, you know, you have two sides that are racing around AI and you mentioned data, like obviously, you know, AI doesn't work unless you have good, strong data, right? And data sets, since there's a lot of there's a lot of investment into that that data infrastructure right now, so that they can leverage generative AI to you know the highest potential. Uh, but similarly, I think you have the bad actors in the space that are also trying to do that race of leveraging generative, right. AI, but for for you know negative reasons. Um, and to counteract that, how have you has that been a topic in terms of like security as like how do we hundred percent, hundred percent? Yes, no, Chris, hundred percent. Data security kind of plays a very important role when you're kind of talking about you know AI because uh, there have been a, you know I've also learned from companies. I've you know spoken to companies where even the smaller enterprise. I'm not talking about larger enterprise. Uh, you can't uh, mess around when it's larger enterprises because they don't they won't implement AI so easily. But with the smaller enterprises. Or even the mid-sized enterprises, I've seen, you know, they have implemented AI and there has been a security breach. The data breach, uh, they haven't, uh, you know, the with the AI capabilities that they added, obviously their uh, data was exposed to the public sometimes and all of those things. So they, that's where data security kind of plays a very important role. And even data governance kind of uh, plays a very important role because if you kind of have like a certain governance which is set, uh, for the data that you have, it kind of plays a very important role. And yes, you're right. You know, we talk to a lot of data security uh, vendors in the space as well, who are kind of solving the problem to for those enterprises who are kind of, kind of you know wanting to implement AI. So how to responsibly uh, implement AI and how to be ethical in the most easiest uh, and most comfortable way is how the data security companies are helping them uh, and making sure that there's no breach of data 
uh, or th- there's no uh, issues in terms of you know obviously uh, keeping the data secure. Yeah, um, interesting. And, and where do you feel like the conversation's going towards in the near future? Is it? Yeah, I mean, I guess like there's you talked about we talked about data, we talked about security, we talked about how it's going to increase productivity. But um, what do you feel like the next hot topic is? I think, uh, you know, AI governance is what I'm hearing from a lot of people. And obviously, AI governance is going to play a very important role. There's uh, data quality, which will be still be spoken and it will be uh, there for a longer, longer term. Uh, You can't uh, not have a good data quality, uh, good quality of data. And, you know, the other big thing that I'm kind of uh, seeing which would be around the AI infrastructure. Uh, and uh, those, uh, I think three things kind of talk for me, at least in terms of the next big things that are coming. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to learn a little about that. And, you know, obviously just, uh, I, I always say we are in that interesting times uh, where things kind of evolve so quickly. So at least from where I see right now, these are the three important things that I see uh, would really make, uh, uh, you know, would be the talk of the town for a while. Yeah. Um, You talk about governance. um, And then I start thinking about, I think, globally, how that how that plays. Right. Because historically, at least in the United States, it's been a little bit more of like the wild west they kind of like leave it a lot more open until it becomes a problem and then True. they all of a sudden become involved uh versus say like the eu which is all, a lot more um i think like strict around how they govern um security right. specifically uh but yeah how do you think about governance on a global scale is it possible um versus like how you know how would how would individual countries or regions approach that maybe differently and do you see like certain areas that are going to be more open to it like the u.s um what are the pros and cons of being more loose with the with the governance versus being more strict so one thing i think uh we just need to be you know we just need to understand it is in the near future or in the next five years most of the countries out there will have some governance in place for sure. Uh, it definitely will depend from country to country about the governance and how they want to implement it. Uh, GDPR being for Europe, obviously, it plays a very important role. It has been implemented pretty well. They're still working on it to make sure they modify it. But they were the first uh, comers into the game, first ones to you know implement that. Obviously, uh, in the states now, uh, there have been a certain you know obviously uh, uh, things which have been signed, and now they have like a few governance uh, activities which would happen. Uh, there would be more countries who would have to follow. If AI, if you want AI, you need to have governance in place for sure because uh, uh, you know that's that's how it. You know you will be protected. Uh, it needs to be controlled in some way because uh, there, they you know when we see uh, uh, you know when we see the data security breach happen. Uh, we always have, uh, you know, certain things that you can blame a tool, you can blame certain group of people. But we one thing that we don't understand is, okay, well, because there is no governance in place, maybe that's why it, this has happened. If uh, there's obviously certain compliances, certain governance that comes into the game, things could be much better. Not like it's not going to happen. It's definitely going to happen if there are, you know, obviously bad guys who are doing bad things. Uh, but uh, still, I feel the, you know, the the long answer to your short one is like every country will have their own governance in place. And having a global um, governance is a little difficult for uh, a little while, but there will be treaties, I feel. When you kind of, you know, having uh, a data that is now in states but needs to go to Europe, there'll be a certain treaty that will come into the place uh, with different governments. And then maybe, you know, there'll be a common pathway or, you know, 
there'll be exchange of data that can happen easily as well, but with governed uh, authorities in place. Got it. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the next part of it is uh, with AI also comes, you know, I think like the, we think about like how are we actually going to come up with the energy to power all the, you know, I don't think a lot, also a lot of people think about this, but how do you power <clears throat> AI at the scale of what it could potentially, like it's, there's one thing of like what it could potentially do, but then there's also the resources it requires to execute on, on the possibilities of that. Um, has that been a topic in, in like creating the infrastructure to power AI? Yes, definitely. I think one thing, uh, you know, we, we, you're right, we kind of always think about, you know, obviously what AI can do, but at the same time, uh, you know, the power of AI and, uh, you know, how it will play an important role in the AI infrastructure is another big topic, which, you know, folks are talking about because it's, there are so, first of all, the most important thing is like the use cases. There are not enough use cases at the moment uh, when you're talking about the AI infrastructure or having different categories as well. Once, you know, over the years when we kind of, now we said, okay, 2024, 2025 is the year of AI implementation. But once we kind of get into the depth where we are now kind of getting, you know, I spoke to a few folks from Bayer company, which is a big, uh, you know, obviously manufacturing healthcare company in uh, Europe. And uh, they, they mentioned about, you know, obviously how they're using AI. So there are obviously bigger players using AI as well. Now, the, the thing is, how much can we learn? How many, how many years or how many hours do we, of use case do we have for that? Once we have like more use cases that we can say that, okay, now we have use cases for like 10 different industries in 10 different verticals we have some data that we can play on in terms of how the AI is doing in different places. But right now, um, yes, it can do various things, but we still don't have the exact, uh, we don't, we still don't know the exact potential of how it is actually making a lot of difference. Like for a certain things like content marketing for uh, smaller, you know, activities, it definitely plays a very important role. Um, I also get a very important question, Chris, always is that do we, uh, is AI going to replace humans? And the answer is definitely no, it's not going to replace humans. It's just going to make you smarter. That's it. And uh, it's just going to help you be more productive about things like we said, and like we spoke about earlier in our conversation too. So that's my thoughts. Got it. Very cool. On that note, I want to say uh, thank you so much for the time and and uh, and carving out some time out of your day. I know you're based in uh, in Mumbai, so it's it's a uh, it's a big time difference for us. But um, thank you so much and <laughs> have the conversation and get your visibility insights around uh, specifically the data data and AI component. Thanks, Chris. It was such a pleasure uh, being on your show and uh, really love the work that you're doing. Thanks once again for inviting me. Of course, thank you.